welcome our next speaker, Dr. Sabina Alam from S1000 platform. And just to mention that Sabina is an editorial director for F1000 platforms and beforehand she did her PhD in neuroimmunology and a postdoc as well at the University of London. So welcome very much. And let me start your presentation. Thank you. Please, this way. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, and especially to talk to you about a topic that's very, very close to my heart. Um, I was speaking earlier on um, about how when I myself had been a student, and also when I was a postdoc, I actually wish that there had been more sessions like this offered um, at my institution because the peer review process in itself is can be quite. Um, confusing, especially for early career researchers. Um, what I'm going to speak to you about today is about innovations in peer review F1000 research. So, uh, Wayman, um, uh, I should say thank you to you for actually taking us through the uh, some of the <laughs> sort of the beginning parts of my talk. Um, so I won't uh, go into it in as much detail, but I've just got a very simplified um, sort of schematic here about the traditional publication process in most journals. So you have a manuscript that gets submitted by, oh, sorry, by the authors. Uh, this is overseen by a reviewing editor, a handling editor. They will be looking at it um, from the point of view of what the aims are for their specific journal, uh, the scope, the level of impact that's required. But there are some mandatory elements they'll be looking at as well. They'll be looking at adherence to research and publication ethics. Um, and uh, perhaps timeliness, if that's important for them too. If the um, editor then decides it's suitable for their journal, um, they will send it to selected peer reviewers. Mo in most journals, um, the editors themselves will be selecting the reviewers. Uh, sometimes the authors are suggesting them. It's up to the editor sometimes if they want to use those suggestions or not. Those reviewers will comment on things like impact, um, how sound the study is, if the analysis stands up, um, if the conclusions are in line with the data, and they feed this back to the, or, uh, to the editor. The editor makes a decision on balance of that. So unlike eLife, um, most journals won't have this collaborative kind of um, discussion process uh, with, uh, between the reviewers and the editors. The reviewers don't see what they've said about each other's, uh, what their own view of this paper is. It really just goes to the editor. The editor makes a judgment call on whether or not uh, can be accepted in principle, maybe that means pending revisions, or if outright it will be rejected. If um, it's ultimately accepted, at that point that's when the readers see it. The readers, of course, are much of the relevant research community. So this, though, can take about three to 12 months because all of this is happening, you know, in not in secret, but behind a wall, behind closed doors. It's between the editors, the reviewers, and the authors to a certain element. Um, three months can be seen as quite good, but some authors can wait 12 months or more. Uh, sorry, so readers can make, uh, wait 12 months or more before they can see the final paper. And that's also quite frustrating for authors as well, because they've probably worked quite long on the paper and had to wait quite a, a long time to have this actually made available. In most journals, the readers are also not aware of who has reviewed the paper. So all they see is a final paper with the author's name. Some journals will reveal who the reviewing editor was, not all of them do, but many journals won't reveal who the reviewers are unless they had an open peer review process. So this can be a problem. Readers are, of course, fellow researchers to the, to, to the authors. They're their peers. And so not having this review process transparent is a problem for many um, authors. Um, the other problem that used to be there that thankfully isn't anymore is about access. So the open access movement that started about 15, 16 years ago in, in full has improved issues around access, allowing people to read more of the research that is done. But there's still many problems with the traditional publishing process. There are delays in the review process, in actually the publication process as well. There's still limited access to data. So 
many researchers, you know, I was like this myself when I was a, you know, a student and a postdoc, you know, you have a paper, but you don't, you can't actually verify the results for yourself because you just take the, word, the author's word for it in terms of what they have chosen to present. There are biases. There are biases for different reasons. Um, there are some journals will be choosing to accept papers based on how important or how exciting it might be. And so some of the equally important but less exciting papers sometimes don't make the cut to get published. Um, so there can be a lack of transparency sometimes in terms of why a particular editor has chosen to accept a paper in their journal, even though the paper itself may be sound. Um, this introduces a, a bias, so there tends to be this tendency for only the exciting papers to be published. And for anyone that's ever conducted a systematic review or meta-analysis will know that it's actually really, really important to have access to all kinds of research, whether they're null, negative findings. Otherwise, you're going to end up with this uh, positively skewed set of results, which is actually not the true picture of what's happening in the research. So that in itself biases our understanding of sciences. And of course it causes research waste. If someone has conducted a study, it may be that they tried to replicate another study, they weren't able to replicate it, they don't publish it because they sometimes think no journal will be interested in that. Um, so that hasn't been reported, that hasn't been communicated. Someone else uses their funding money to do the same kind of study, not knowing actually it didn't work for someone else. So it leads to a lot of research waste. And the other key element, which Wayman also had uh, pointed out to, is actually the credit for the reviewers. If the research community aren't actually aware, in many cases the authors are also not aware about who has reviewed their paper, that reviewer has not re actually received credit. They've got acknowledgement from the editor, from the journal, but not really from the wider research community, which is also not completely fair, because reviewers often do a lot of work to help to get a paper into shape. So there are problems around uh, peer review, the one thing everyone can agree with is that it doesn't work properly. But the other, other problem is we have nothing else. There, there's nothing else uh, there in it that can replace peer review. The problems around it, it slows down the, review pr uh, the publication process. Um, you can get an inconsistent set of um, comments from reviewers and editors. Authors sometimes come back saying that you, what is the journal asking them to do when they've got the reviewer reports is not always clear. Not everyone can go back to them with the sort of comments that eLife can. Um, there's the uh, problems around transparency. Who are the reviewers? Authors often don't know themselves. And then there's also the argument that the more innovative a paper, the more controversial a paper, um, the more important it is that the review process should be transparent because there have been concerns about innovative ideas getting blocked um, during the review process. So in response to the fact that peer review isn't perfect and doesn't you know, solve all the problems, there have been various experiments throughout the years. So um, as Wayman had referred to earlier on, single blind is the most traditional format. This uh, has been around in the, in the format we know it as today from about the 1940s. I think it started in JAMA. Um, but that in itself, uh, as I've been saying, is a problem because authors should know who the reviewers are. Not everyone believes that's true. Not everyone believes that that will solve issues around transparency or conflicts of interest. So another experiment has been double-blind peer review. Um, and this, this is where neither the authors or the reviewers know each other. And some journals have been trialing this. In many cases, it's opt-in rather than mandatory. Um, I've referred to what May Wayman had been talking about. It's collaborative, but it, um, I'll use his term now, cons consultative. Um, and, of course, then open peer review, which started in, uh, I think, 99 in the BMJ. And this, was, this um, is where the reviewers and the authors know who each other are. But there are different levels of open peer review in terms of what the readers see. So in some journals, what they will do is um, uh, publish the full review reports as well as the review name. In some journals, they'll just publish the reports. In some journals, they'll just publish the review name. Um, and at F1000 Research, we actually published the entire thing. Um, so then the more newer experiment is post-publication peer review. This is what we're doing at F1000 Research, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. But who, you know, why, why did we actually 
go down this post-publication route. Um, post-publication means the paper is published first and then reviewed. So the re readers see the paper and the readers also then see who are the reviewers of that paper. This is the brainchild of uh, VTEC Trucks. He was also one of the main proponents of the open access movement because he um, was also behind the Biomed Central journals. And his argument really is that um, we as publishers shouldn't be contributing to how communication of research finding is being slowed down. We actually need to facilitate it being sped up. In a, but it can only be sped up if it's done transparently. So the idea is that um, the authors are then more accountable for what they're choosing to submit to a journal because that they know that is going to be published immediately, as long as there's no ethical concern. So it will still go through some editorial checks to make sure that uh, there hasn't been a breach of uh, research ethics or publication ethics and so on. Um, and because that's out there in the open, then the reviewers will be invited in full view of the re uh, readers as well, because as a report comes in, a reader sees a report has come in from this reviewer and they can see what the reviewer says. So the idea is that it's transparent and it's fast because the paper has been made available. So, um, you know, his argument, which is why he created Up 1000 Research, is that the journal concept needs to change. You know, how we're doing things at the moment needs to change. The world has moved on. There is now a, a much higher demand for rapid access. Um, research is so much more global now than it used to be. Um, there's a demand to accelerate the impact of research. People are now moving much more towards actually looking at the merits of a specific paper rather than in terms of where it was published. And there's an increasing drive towards open science because people are now demanding more things like access to the data so that they can verify for themselves and also to help with the reproducibility. So we refer to ourselves as an open science publishing platform. We tend not to use the word journal because we're publishing before the peer review process, but we still conduct the peer review process. So the idea behind this open science publishing platform is that it's author-led. Like I said, the authors are, are um, responsible for the version of the article that they submit. They're also suggesting the reviewers. Um, it, or it's leading to immediate publication, so I can say in general, if we receive a paper, um, it can be online after typesetting um, and editorial checks, it can be online within five to seven days after submission. Um, the refereeing is done openly, so it's transparent. And with F1000 Research, um, what we also say is that there shouldn't be a bias in terms of what we choose to publish or not. If it's scientifically valid, then it should be published. All the data is included, that's mandatory for us, unless there are identification issues. And um, if the article passes peer review, I'll explain what I mean about that in a bit, then it's also indexed in places like PubMed and um, Scopus and so on. And it's gold open access, so there is an article processing charge, but this in general tends to be lower than many other journals because they're doing this post-publication process. So this is how it looks for us. Uh, we have a paper that's submitted to F1000 Research. This is overlooked by the editorial team at F1000 Research. The things that we're looking for is, is its scope. So we're interested mainly in life sciences and clinical research. Um, have the authors provided data? Uh, what, what I mean by that is the source data, so the data upon which their findings rely. Um, if there are access issues because it's proprietary information, then they have to explain that. But you know there are some uh, there are some uh, reasons for not actually giving access to data. Um, ethics, so we're checking for things like plagiarism, checking for things like um, that they've got the appropriate approval from research ethics boards, that they've got consent. Um, and also we're checking the author's suggested reviewers. When the author submits, they have to suggest five reviewers. But those reviewers have to meet our reviewer criteria. So we're checking for things like, have they collaborated before? If they've collaborated, then they can't review. Are they from the same institution? If they are, then they can't be a reviewer. Um, are they on topic? So can they actually assess this paper? So we check all that, and if, um, if the reviewers don't meet our criteria, we don't invite them. And then we would go back to the authors and say, we need to actually adhere to this criteria. There are some cases where the author actually struggles a bit and they go, actually, I don't know any more people to suggest. 
So then what we do is that we'll then select some of the reviewers and we send it to the authors and say, well, here's our suggestions. These are the people we think could review your paper. And then if the author approves those suggestions, then they're invited. So if all is well, the article is then published and it receives a DOI. And at that point, it's immediately available to all readers. So the research community has access to it. And the article is clearly labeled as awaiting peer review. So the, uh, and it's not indexed at this point. So it's only available on the F1000 research platform. And so all the, uh, anyone reading the article, coming to the article can see it hasn't been reviewed and it's awaiting that. At the same time, the reviewers are invited by the editorial team so because we check things like their email addresses and so on. And um, the reviewers then upload their reports. So they submit their reports and they're asked to comment on things like the scientific validity, the methods and analysis, the strength of the conclusions. So that also is then, uh, and they would recommend if they're approving the paper or rejecting, or the question mark means approved with reservations. At that point, the review report itself also receives a DOI. So the review report is also a citable document. Um, the authors will see this report as soon as it's uploaded. They get notification. And it's the author's choice if they're going to review or not. We're not forcing them to actually uh, revise anything. If, if the reviewers have actually come back with some really strong concerns that could potentially be breaching some kind of ethical concern, then we, all, you know, we will obviously get involved. But if it's about the science of the paper, and the reviewers have maybe said, no, I don't actually think this is valid because you haven't done X, Y, Z, the authors will see that, and it's up to them if they are going to address this or not. And uh, the um, authors, if they choose to actually address this, they will submit a revision. The revision will also then be seen by the readers, and it will go back to the reviewers, and the reviewers can comment on the revised version. The important thing here is that the, review, uh, the readers also see, at the same time, what um, has been said by the reviewers and what has been said by this paper. And this is another, another way of sort of depicting the whole process. Um, what I'll sort of point to here is about th three along. Um, we're saying about how the refereeing process is open, but the readers can also comment at the same time on the article. So the idea is that the paper is released to the entire research community. It's not sort of hidden behind a wall. And the recommendations that actually influence whether or not it will be indexed in PubMed and Scopus and so on are these three, as I said, approved, which means that the reviewer is basically saying it's scientifically valid, um, approved with reservations. Obviously, they have reservations there or not approved. And the idea is that the papers become like wikis because they're constantly updated and versioned and the, it's uh, com including the comments from readers. And so the idea is that as and when the need arises, authors can revise or they can even update. So sometimes authors will actually come back and say, we've actually had a, you know, have a little bit more information about this study that we want to add to, and they can update their papers. So it's, it's there as a living article, so to speak. So post-publication peer review, uh, these are the main aspects of it. The authors are responsible for suggesting the reviewers, but like I said, these reviewers have to meet our um, um, reviewer criteria. The, so we're checking that they're not close collaborators, um, that they don't have any discernible competing interests, that they have suitable subject expertise. Sometimes you have papers that are very niche, are highly specialized, and actually it's almost impossible to find reviewers who have no uh, previous collaboration with the authors. So if that's the case, um, we'll measure this on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it's far, we think it's far better to invite a reviewer who has the subject knowledge rather than someone who has no collaboration but not the appropriate subject knowledge. So what we do in those cases is say to the um, reviewer that they have to have a clear declaration of their competing interest with the paper. So, um, like I said, it's the team that's responsible for inviting the reviewers on behalf of authors. Uh, the article is published online, and peer review takes place in full view of readers and authors, and the article status summary highlights the progress. So this is what a, a paper would look like if you were to go on F1000 research. Um, yeah. So, um, don't expect you to read the whole thing, but this orange thing here shows you that the article has been revised. If this had not been reviewed, there'd actually be a big 
note here saying awaiting peer review. Um, this has been reviewed, and this is the history of the review. Um, these are all clickable. So what this example shows you is that the first version of the um, article was reviewed by just one reviewer. And this reviewer had concerns. At that point, the author actually chose to revise rather than continuing the review process because the reviewer had actually raised some points that the author wanted to um, actually address. So when the second version came in, the same reviewer also reviewed it and approved it. So all their concerns had been addressed. But of course, you can't have a, a paper with just one review. It's not going to get indexed. So we then invited further reviewers. And so these are two new reviewers. One of them approved the paper immediately. But a third one also had problems, um, some concerns. So what I should say here as well is that sometimes it happens that after the, um, the reviewers have come back and commented, we're also asking, have you looked at the analysis? Have you been able to assess the statistics? If they haven't, then we have to recruit another reviewer. And so when the authors revised again, um, at this point, this reviewer still was happy with the paper. And the one who did have concerns uh, was also happy with the paper. But because at version two, this already had two approved, this had been indexed. So the, uh, with PubMed, the agreement is that if the paper has two reviewers who've approved it, it will, get it will get indexed. If they've had one reviewer who has approved it, but two who have some concerns, approved with reservations, it will also get indexed. Um, so, uh, so we still need to keep an eye on it, though, because um, basically, if it's been indexed, we're saying this is a scientifically valid article. So if there are, uh, it's rare, but if there are cases where we think actually another element of this still needs to be reviewed, we will then uh, ask the authors to suggest more reviews. So when this gets indexed, I'll talk about PubMed specifically here. When this is indexed in PubMed, what happens, in Pu it also gets submitted to PubMed Central. So readers don't just have to come to our platform. They can also go into PubMed Central. And if they access this article on PubMed Central, they see all the versions. So the, the, and they'll see the reviewer comments. So you see the paper, you see which version it is, you scroll down, you see what the reviewers have said. The only thing you wouldn't see in PubMed Central is if any readers have posted comments. That would only be seen here. So this is, as I said, this is the criteria for being indexed. And this is what you would see. Like, so the um, reviewer comments, is um, part. they're all part of the same file of the article. So, um, even if you were to print the article out, you would be printing it out alongside the reviewer comments. It's not sort of through some different links. So basically, you'd see the reviewer report. This reviewer has approved with reservations. You as a reader would see how what the authors have said, how they've responded. And you'd also see if there's been any readers that have commented. And the idea for the referees is they get full credit for contributing to the discussion. They're focusing on helping the authors to improve their work. They're, they're, they're not actually trying to get this uh, published or unpublished because it's already been published. So the focus there is on the science and the science alone. And their reports are part of the formal literature because they're citable documents. So my last slide. <laughs> so why did we need to change the system? It's for transparency, really. Transparency in the peer review process for authors as well as readers. And transferring control from publishers back to the research community, giving reviewers credit for their work, because after all, they put a lot of work into helping a paper reach its final form, and really trying to facilitate an open and collaborative process between review and comment uh, between the authors and reviewers to make it part of an open scientific discussion. Also reducing bias, bias because we're not actually placing um, necessarily um, sort of a pressure on the paper needing to be novel. We publish null negative findings replication studies, because we think they're all equally important. And also ensuring credibility of published open access content. Some of you may have heard the term predatory open access journals. Um, they actually do uh, sometimes make people who are not aware of open access journals a bit nervous about submitting. So by being fully transparent, you know, we're basically standing by any content that we have published and ultimately speeding up how scientific findings can be communicated. And that's the end. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ronnie from the MRC Cognition and Brain Science Unit. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if we can uh, just say a few words about uh, publication of posters in slide. Yes. So we also publish uh, po um, so posters as long as the scientific posters and scientific slides on our platform. They're not peer reviewed. Um, it's basically another way that we provide open access content to the research community. So if, for example, you're at a conference and you've taken your you created your poster. Uh, or set of slides, you can actually submit that to F1000 Research, and they're free as well. Um, so there's no APC involved, they're not peer reviewed, it's just out there, they all get a DOI as well, so they become citable. So I could actually, if I wanted to, I could put, put, put this you know, on F1000 Research and have a cited, citable set of slides. Thank you. One more question? So uh, let's thank Sabina again. <laughs> thank you.